thank you organizers uh, and uh, thank you Raghu sir. So uh, let me call upon my panelists, uh, Dr. Manu Prasad, Dr. Chakar Vora, Dr. Prahlad Elamati, Dr. Sunil Chopade, Dr. Sunit Lokwani. So five panelists and uh, please join me on the stage. So uh, since morning we have been hearing a lot about uh, EGFR lung cancer as and, uh, one of my colleagues was recent, uh, just telling me it makes for a book on itself, uh, it looks like uh, like what, uh, what used to be a simple EGFR uh, TKA single agent drug has become so complicated in first line itself and if you see the setting of the, the previous discussion, the number of options have increased in first line and as I made this PPT, I realized that more and more it has become uh, uh, more murky after the subsequent progression. Okay, change the slides to the next slide. Yeah, so, so uh, if you have paid attention to the earlier four uh, papers that were presented by all my uh, I mean speakers, uh, previous speakers, uh, everyone has made one comment in the introduction setting that resistance or progression is mandatory, is inevitable after first line EGFR TKA treatment and uh, so let me try to jump and uh, ask my panelists from left to right if you can take up what are the mechanisms of resistance of after first line treatment with EGFR TKA. Yeah, at 20, at 21, one end you can start and then uh, come forward, I can't speak, see all of you also. Uh, Dr. Sunil here, uh, so there are uh, uh, two, one is histological uh, resistance when uh, tumor can transform into small cell. Uh, that is small cell transformation and the second is uh, uh, development of resistance one is T790 which is the more common mechanism and uh, the other uh, includes MET uh, amplification or MET mutation okay Prada. so uh, so on target on target uh, mutations and uh, off target basically on target EGF or T790M off target like uh, meta amplification, it can be histological transformation or uh, it can be epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. Okay. So, uh, how often do you, uh, the next, how often do you see this histologic transformation? I mean, um, um, probably 15 to 20 percent. Uh, I think that was mentioned quite, uh, this number is mentioned in that ranges only, but I am asking in your experience, how often do you see histologic transformation? The next panel. So around five to ten percent. Five to ten percent. I think uh, every one of us do agree that. Uh, so that makes for the next question. So are you okay with doing a liquid biopsy, or do you think that we should attempt to do a tissue biopsy in this uh, particular scenario? So trick question, I believe it is. <laughs> so uh, tissue studies do remain a gold standard so far, but if it's not accessible, then the liquid biopsy. So if it is accessible, you would still tend to do a. a, a uh, tissue biopsy. Just to I mean, uh, make sense into the discussion so far, we can have a primary or innate resistance to EGFR TKA where the patient doesn't respond to EGFR uh, TKA drug and progresses within the first three months. Uh, that happens when there is an upfront uh, 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 mutation that was not picked up, a non sensitive mutation that was not picked up, or uh, a significant uh, burden of resistance pathways like TP53 that was there that was not picked up or seen or at rest or it can be an acquired resistance which is more um, um, common where cancer develops resistance after a certain period of time they must have received uh, EGFR TKA and had response and then progressed and we also understand uh, regarding the resistance pathway Dr. Manu uh, of first generation TKA and second uh, the third generation TKA how do you think uh, Differs. Do you think it differs? Yeah, uh, in case of first generation TK, the most important mechanism is T790. Yes. So, in case so of, on target mutation. In case of osimertinib resistance, now we have more information on that area. That, that in, includes a lot of off target mechanisms also. But uh, and the historical transformation practically we do not see, though we have talked about it uh, often, we do not see historical transformation frequently. And uh, among it also in, in the third generation, TK sometimes there the can be GFR mutations which can like see cell photosynthesis which can actually respond to the first generation TKs. Yes. So both these mechanisms are important in case of third generation. Yeah. So 
the important point here in this particular pie chart is the mechanism of resistance is different if you are using a first generation, second generation EGFRTK and if you are using a third generation EGFRTK. So mostly with first generation, the most common mechanism of resistance is a non-target T790M mutation and for second, third generation TK, it's either a loss of EGFR uh, mutation or a meta amplification or a HEP2 mutation or a C797S on target mutation. So more of off target mutations in third generation, more on on target mutation in first and second generation TK. So what is this on target and off target that we are talking about? If you have, if you see the EGFR uh, receptor, there are certain other receptors also that is MET, HEP, uh, RED, HEP2, which can have receptor crosstalk. If there is a mutation in the EGFR uh, receptor which is leading on to the resistance of TK that is called on target, typically we see in first and second generation with T790M. It can happen with third generation also osimertinib like C797X mutations that we call as, but more often in osimertinib you have off target mutation. Any, but, uh, any difference of opinion among my panelists or anything that you want to add on to this? If not, we will uh, go forward. So, um, so the off-target or extrinsic kinase extrinsic or bypass resistance pathways like MET, uh, HEP2, RED, and sometimes rarely I, ROS1, and NTRK can also creep up. These become more prominent as we are using osimertinib more and more in first line of uh, treatment. So, uh, let me have a brief case scenario, 55 year old female, metastatic adeno NSCLC, uh, June 2022 was the date of diagnosis, EGFR exon 19 deletion by LGS, started on osimertinib, progression after 14 months in lung and bone, CNS is clear. Here, uh, Dr. Manu, from your end this time, how do you go forward, do you biopsy this patient and what is the biopsy that we are going to do? Yes, uh, so here, uh, like, uh, it, it will be sort of a shared decision making because uh, if we can access the language easily without much complication, then if the patient is willing for an invasive procedure, I'll go for a biopsy. But otherwise, uh, I'm comfortable in going for a liquid biopsy also. Yeah, here, uh, I mean, I'm not also clear about this, but we do see it uh, here about histologic transformation being mentioned in upwards of 10 to 20 percent. So, do you think doing a tissue biopsy will, I mean, liquid biopsy will uh, not give you that clue probably? I mean, in practice, uh, I should not come across any sort of small cell transformation. Yes. So, if it is going to be a high risk procedure uh, for a biopsy, I will not push for a biopsy in this case. No. Uh, we try the liquid NGS in case there is no flow in that, and uh, if the patient is asphaltic in next line of treatment, maybe we can we look at this question. Sure. Uh, I was given to understand that Dr. Arvind Kumar is also part of the panel. Sir, please join. Uh, in the meantime, I'll uh, go forward to the next. So, we uh, uh, re biopsy and liquid biopsy is the first question. So, if you do a biopsy, what is it that you are going to send for this? Uh, uh, I mean, the sample to what are the tests that you want to do? Uh, the next, uh, uh, so, yes. so if you are doing a re biopsy, I mean, I'm assuming right now that the patient is approved and everything is doable here, and we are doing a re sonic biopsy, not a liquid one. Yeah. So, uh, I'd like to send all the tests again and resistance mechanism also if there is. So, would you uh, do for PDL1 and TME also in this particular scenario? Yes, I think this is. Yes, fine. Uh, I mean, sir, I, I hope you are following up this case. We are basically discussing EGFR, uh, post EGFR TKA progression, and the patient was on osimertinib and has progressed. And uh, we have done a biopsy, and repeat biopsy was showing this. Persistence of EGFR exon 19 mutation, no other relevant mutation was found. PDL1 by TPS was 8, TMB was 7.7. .7. A broad panel NGS that we are that is accessible now was sent. Like this is the report that we have. So how do you uh, go forward in this particular scenario? Uh, PDL1 uh, uh, by TPS of 8 and TMB of 7.7. .7. Uh, combination chemotherapy. Combination chemotherapy, platinum tablet. Yeah. Anything that you want to add on top of that? I you I can consider, but uh, not sure of the benefit. Okay. Go for the TMB less than ten and. Uh, so are you being nivolumab or pembrolizumab or etizolizumab or any such preference? Which platform? Which, uh, Sorry. Which platform? TPS, Daco or Daco. Daco. Then. Uh, Twenty-two C three. 
Dipo for 22 C3 of 8 uh, chemotherapy, I would prefer. I'm uh, sorry, immunotherapy along with chemo. So, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, let's say pembrolizumab yeah. we are talking yeah, about. So, platinum tablet plus pembrolizumab, uh, subsequent, uh, I mean, Pratla, uh, I'm not able to see. The so, I would like to go for chemotherapy only. Uh, only chemotherapy only. Anybody else, any, any other opinion? Sintilimab can be added given the... Okay, Sintilimab is a Chinese drug, I don't think it is available in India now. Sir, I mentioned in my uh, start of my speech session, that unlike all other Chinese pro uh, products, this product is showing some promise. Yes, but yes, but, uh, but the availability of the product should also be there. I agree with you, it's a good, uh, it's a good try. So, liquid biopsy was done, TB53 mutation is also there, performance status 1. Yeah, any other opinion? Any other takers apart from platinum tablet, Dr. Manu? Yeah, we certainly prefer platinum permitranside tablet. Other options that will be discussed will be the ABCP regimen. ABCP regimen? Okay. So, these are the options of treatment that I have put forward. Platinum tablet chemo, I think most of our panel are uh, uh, going for this. Platinum plus tablet, uh, platinum tablet plus pembro as per Dr. Ranadin. Some uh, um, benefit of platinum tablet plus ATSO plus um, was also favored. Amivatinam plus Lazatinib and was another option. So let's dwell into. So uh, Dr. Lakhan Kashyap has uh, uh, put forth this particularly interesting paper Chemotherapy for patients with EGFR mutated NSALC progression after EGFR TKI in unselected multi center cohort study. This is predominantly chemotherapy, some bit of immunotherapy, some bit of bevacizumab. What this particular paper gives us is that chemotherapy post EGFR TK progression platinum tablet gives us a PFS of around 5 or 5.5 months. This is what this particular paper has shown. Keynote 789, Dr. Arvin's option, platinum tablet plus pembrolizumab, a negative study. This is a phase 3 trial. We have two studies, Keynote uh, Checkmate 722 with nivolumab, Keynote 789 with uh, pembrolizumab, both after progression of EGFR uh, first line TKI. Uh, a good number of patients have progressed after rosimatinib, platinum tablet plus pembrolizumab, platinum tablet alone, uh, no benefit. After median fall of 42 months, PFS of 4, 5.6 versus 5.5 months, no improvement in uh, PFS, no imp specific improvement on overall survival, no, uh, not, it's a, uh, basically a negative study. Same with checkmate 722, Nemo plus platinum tablet versus platinum tablet alone, PFS primary endpoint, no difference, even in PDL1 high, more, even in patients with more than PDL1 of 50, uh, uh, score of 50, there was no benefit of addition of nivolumab. So, what does my panel think of these two negative studies, Keynote 789 and, I mean, uh, um, uh, Keynote 789 and Checkmate 722, uh, from the other end of the this molecular um, mutation positive tumors have been considered as a been, uh, resistant to immunotherapy. Okay. The response rate have been uh, less. So uh, I think here also we can see that uh, there is uh, no as good response to immunotherapy compared to other uh, non driven mutations. So uh, this is what we have been suspecting all along. Um, we know that in first line immunotherapy doesn't work in EGFR TK, uh, EGFR mutation population. So even in second line also it's not working. But somehow ABCP regimen IM power 150, Dr. Prashad, you are done. Uh, and subsequently LEJ uh, 043 study, both of them showed positive uh, this thing. So what do you think has made the difference? Okay, so possibly the addition of BEV is making the immune uh, and anyway, tumor microenvironment more conducive to uh, immunotherapy. There is an EGFR VEGF crosstalk where VEGF is over regulated in EGFR uh, uh, mutation patients, and VEGF inhibition probably has a better role. This is something that Dr. Ashish has also touched upon in his uh, presentation where adding on to additional drugs over and above EGFR TKA probably preventing secondary resistance is a, one of the pathways. Probably that is the same. Uh, what dysentric did different from, uh, I mean, high power studies did different from both keynote study as well as checkmate study and has shown some benefit. So going into the data, ABCP is not, uh, uh, I mean, power to uh, address this question, but it gave us the initial impetus, initial idea that probably this quadruplet regimen benefits in this particular patient population, but it's only 26 patients who had progressed after EGFR TKA. 
and subsequently we have two more similar struggles the one that was discussed earlier by the orient 31 orient 31 discussion, discussion is here uh, he clearly mentioned that this drug is probably uh, here the, uh, the combination is Sintilimab plus Devacizumab biosimilar plus Pemetrexid platinum doublet. So this combination seems to be benefiting the patients better. The PFS is higher, the overall survival is higher and uh, this is a positive trend. Um, so um, anything regarding this, uh, I think Dr. Sunit has discussed this. I think we should wait for the final result. This was an interim result. Yeah. It was very promising. But I think, uh, so this is second interim analysis pre-planned and it's showing a uh, PFS um, benefit, right? So yes. uh, I think I agree with you that we need to wait for the final results. But again, similar this thing, NEJ043 phase 2, ABCP regimen, again, it is of bare carbo uh, and uh, fatty taxel. In EGFR TK resistant, Japanese trial, single arm phase. PFS is the primary endpoint. The PFS benefit was supposed to be, uh, uh, I mean, the null uh, hypothesis is if the PFS is less than 6 months, benefit is if there is more than 10 months of benefit. The PFS benefit has come to around 7.5 months with this particular trial. Though it has not reached the status, I mean, uh, predetermined significance, still the authors concluded that the benefit is significant enough and the overall survival is about 21 months. Probably this is something that mandates a phase 3 trial and that is ongoing as we speak. So, coming to MET amplification, uh, regarding MET, uh, uh, anybody had any experience of how to target MET or have you added any TKS on top of this? Any experience of the panel, like CAP MET name or anything? Is coming up big time. Sorry, yeah, is coming up big time, and Emivantamab is already available in market. It's bloody expensive, though it is available in market and uh, it is uh, approved for EGFR exon 20. Dr. Ramit, uh, do you see meta amplification frequently, or if you see meta amplification, how is it that you are going to address this particular thing? Yes, obviously, this is all post EGFR. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, uh, this is the most common uh, pathway of Yes, especially yes, after osimatinib, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, we have our drug for this. Uh, okay, so MET amplification we do see in about 15 to 20 percent of patients defined by FISH specifically, defined by NGS also with specific numbers. So before you label the patient as MET amplification, important to see what the NGS report is. There is a host of trials that are ongoing, phase 1B TATO trial, we can add capmatinib onto it, we can add depotinib onto it, there are phase 1B and phase 2 trials. And recently, Mariposa, the initial trial uh, uh, results are up, out, Mariposa 2, which had amivatinib plus lazatinib plus platinum tablet, compared with amivatinib plus chemo platinum tablet, versus chemo uh, platinum doublet alone, there is a significant improvement of progression free survival, 8.3 months with the quadruple regimen versus 4.2 months for the platinum doublet alone. So, amivantimab definitely works in EGF for post-TK progression, not just in MET amplifications. If you combine with lazatinib, probably it works in across EGF for TK. We are final as I debating the mariposa 2 final results, but this is probably what we are going to look forward to. Agnostic strategies, uh, uh, if there is no specific biomarker driven approaches, we obviously will go for uh, platinum tablet alone. You know? So this is in nutshell, acquired resistance, if you have on target mutation like P790M, post first line uh, EGF or TK, the answer is simple, possibly If you have C797, yes, especially the trans mutation, not the cis mutation, this is something that you have to go back and discuss with your NGS specialist. You can go back and add the first generation EGFR TKA to continue osimatinib. Uh, if the subsequent apparent pathway like MET amplification is found, we have drugs for that as well. We have had to amplification. And if you don't have anything, we have age old chemotherapy to fall back on. Immunotherapy specifically, you need to add, you need to add the bevacizumab probably, that's what is looking at. So I will just summarize uh, the discussion so far in the interest of time. So EGFR TK post progression is a difficult scenario for us to manage. It is becoming more uh, uh, difficult. Uh, I mean, probably it will become more clear or more murky with the more uh, emerging data. 
Platinum tablet chemo is the current standard of care, but the expected PFS is very low. It is about five months. Efforts are done to improve the standard of care. So we definitely will do the NGS to understand the resistance pathway, whether it is a re-biopsy or liquid biopsy or combination of both as I have done is something that is up for a debate. Promising options are immunotherapy is there, but we probably we need to add Revacizumab to facilitate a more favorable tumor microenvironment for immunotherapy. MET inhibitors, specifically amimantimab, is going to come up big way in this one, especially in combination with lazatinib. So with this, I conclude right on time. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists and uh, for this opportunity.